All right, so this is a little bit more of a training than a talk, so to say, but there is a little bit of a talk portion of it. So just first off, so I'm more uh, familiar with the crowd, how many of you would say you have done some malware analysis by raise of hand? Okay, and that, how many of you would say you ha are familiar with walking through a Windows executable in Ollie Debug or a, a similar debugger? Okay, and then full reversing of using IDA or some other static analysis? Okay, so I'm, I don't know, not, definitely not up at the top, but I'll share with you a couple of tips and tricks um, that I've come across and hopefully it's interesting and, and worthwhile. So, to start out with um, just a couple of terminology, uh, or coverage of some terminology. So, for the purpose of this talk, I'll probably swap these three terms quite a bit, binary, or sample, or executable. This is the program or the code that I'm going to be analyzing. Uh, sometimes I'll also swap it with that second statement, or second one, PE, and this is a file format for Windows that, rep that is the executable file format, the primary one. Anyhow, AV, we probably all know that, that one's not necessary, but, all right. Okay, entry point, this one's a little bit more uh, specialized, I guess, something that you may not be familiar with. When, when you write a program in C++, you write your int main, right? Or, yeah, C, C++. The entry point in a Windows portable executable is the first line of code that the programmer wrote after that the operating system has handed execution over to that, um, that executable. I'll go with that for now. Um, there's a stack, a lot of you guys are familiar with that concept. It's a data structure in memory. The last item that you place on the stack is the first item to come off. And then exception handling. Uh, you know, this is something I'm sure we all enjoyed in our CS classes, if you took those or whatnot, and what, if you're programming, you know, ex how to handle exceptions. Um, so it is the code that takes care of the mess that you have made otherwise. Now, I, I introduce, or I mention those because we're going to see this sample that we're looking at take advantage of exception handling. Let's see. All right, some of the tools that we will be using. A debugger. So, Ollie Debug is the tool that I'll be using. You can see it listed down there. There are a couple of, there are plenty of other ones, right? Uh, and as you've probably noticed, my talk is going to focus on Windows malware analysis. So, um, Ollie Debug, there's Ida's Debugger, GDB that's primarily useful on Linux or Unix OSs. Um, this is a, a debugger is a utility that allows you to step line by line, if that's your desire, through the assembly code or the machine code uh, that makes up that binary you're analyzing. You'll see that it shows you the instructions, so the, the inst code that it will run. It allows you to see memory as each ex uh, code is, as each line is executed, you can see how memory was manipulated, and also the CPU registers, how those were modified and or used. All right, and then a disassembler is, so this is your static analysis of an executable. You'll be able to look at the code, but you're not running it. So obviously a vulnerability of a debugger is you're running the code. You need to take measures to ensure that you haven't compromised your network or your computer. So there's IDA Pro and Hopper. There's definitely other ones, but those are the ones I'm familiar with. So. Key point, debugger, running code, uh, disassembler, just viewing it, hopefully, right? Uh, so the sample that we're gonna take a look at is just an email from a well-known consumer electronics store. Um, it had a zip file attached to it. I opened the zip, looked like a Microsoft Word document. Of course it wasn't. Um, it's well detected by AV, so I guess the, the key of this is I don't think this is anything super special. <clears throat> Hopefully you're not expecting any crazy malware. Um, but it, nonetheless, it will allow us to show some of the concepts that are applicable to more, more advanced malware analysis. So I probably went through this a little too quick, but at the start of the talk, 
I kind of gave this a new title, which was how to train your malware or something, how to, how to get to know your malware, I don't know. So there's kind of a running theme. You can laugh if you want, whatever. Uh, there, so first, we need to keep the sample that we're analyzing controlled, right? So why do we do that? To protect ourselves, to protect our network. Um, how do we do that? Generally, we run it in a virtualized environment on a dedicated machine. I don't have the funds to do that right now, so this is my machine. Terrible as it is. But. Um, let's see. Ma make the malware believe it is free. So this concept is your malware authors out there, they know that people are looking at their code, right? So they're going to take measures to try to detect if someone is analyzing this malware, either dynamically or statically. And if they detect that, if they're able to detect that, take an action to thwart your analysis. So as a malware analyst, your job is to do your very best to make that environment, when you're doing dynamic analysis, make that environment seem like it is a real user, not an analyst. So how many of you would think that your, uh, your secretary at the office is going to be running Wireshark on her desktop, his or her desktop? Very unlikely, right? So you probably don't want to run Wireshark on your, directly on your analysis machine. But how do you capture the packets that are emitted from a compromised machine? Well, you have another virtual machine that is the default gateway for that, the, the machine that is running the malware. So any uh, traffic that's or originated from the compromised host is picked up by your, your sniffer box or your gateway box. That's where you run Wireshark. That's, that machine, in my, uh, my mode of operation, basically, that machine is where I collect information and, and try to make sure that the environment for, that, uh, for the compromised machine really looks like the internet or the real environment. So what do I mean by that? We run fake services. We, we resolve DNS, and of course, there's various tricks that the authors can take to detect that, but you do the best you can and you improvise, uh, you improve as you go on. All right, so to one method or one approach that I take to malware analysis, so I'm okay with static analysis, I can, I can do some of that, but sometimes it's a lot easier to do dynamical analysis, walk through a debugger and let the code reveal itself. Now, do you walk through every single line? You know, that's very unlikely because that's going to take a while. But you'll, as you go through malware analysis, you'll learn where you may want to set a breakpoint and let it run to that breakpoint so that you capture the information that occurred between the, that and the previous breakpoint. Um, so chances are the malware is going to try to get away, and we're going to see a couple of examples of that. Um, there will be, especially the exceptions. So earlier I mentioned, you know, the code that handles when something goes wrong. And then there's also debugger detection. So Ollie debug, just really simple, right? Ollie debug runs as an executable in Windows, ollie or something like that. So if I'm writing malware, I do a process enumeration and I check for ollie is it running? Or I check for wireshock.exe, is it running, right? And primitive, but I may have detected that you are analyzing this malware. So the point here is, well, I guess I'm, I'm kind of blending these points, but um, traffic analysis, file system registry analysis, that's going to get you a certain way, a, a certain, you're going to learn a certain amount about the sample, but if it has detected your environment as being in an analysis environment, or if it has detected your environment as not being the target environment, then it may not actually do the intended actions, and you may have lost out on what that that sample is actually intended to do. So that's why static analysis and or runtime analysis through a debugger is beneficial. You're able to a little bit further trick that sample into thinking that it's in the right place. All right, I'm gonna skip this for a minute. Um, all right, so this is just one function that I wanna point out. Git proc address, and I apologize, it's probably hard to see. And, 
Okay, yeah. So, git proc address. Um, although I don't know, I'm sure it stands for git procedure address. Basically, this is a way for a Windows executable to, at runtime, discover the address of code for a function that it needs from an already established library. So, um, there's a library winInet.dll, and it provides, as you can guess, internet connectivity, internet functions. Um, your malware may want to call out using the internet, probably, right? And it could use git proc address to locate the function, the address of the function that it wants to utilize to make a call out. Alternatively, more, I guess more easily discoverable, right? It could have the, that function named imported. In, so this, I have to step back a little bit. In the Windows PE executable file format, there's an import table. And this lists the functions that you're, the, the libraries and the functions from those libraries that that executable will use. So the malware sample could have this winInet function, winInet send HTTP request right in that import table. But that's an easy catch for an analyst, right? So instead, maybe the author will be a little bit more tricky and he'll use git proc address to at runtime resolve where that address is. So it's no longer a quick scan in the import table to see what functionality occurs. Now, if they don't take other measures, it is a quick scan in strings to see that that, is, that function name is there. So there's other uh, measures that would be necessary to make that deception actually work. But. All right, on to the part that I am a lot more excited for. We'll say that. I apologize, I didn't take the time to make sure that Windows wouldn't update itself, so. <laughs> You're gonna see that probably a couple times. All right, so just to explain the environment that I've got here, I have uh, Remnux, which is just a Linux-based uh, malware analysis distro, and it is running Wireshark, as you can see here, a packet capture program. It's also running something called INET SIM, which starts up a bunch of listening ports. Um, it's running a DNS spoofer, for lack of better terms. Uh, any DNS request that comes into it will be answered with its own IP address. So the effect of that, of course, is when the malware sample tries to call out to baddomain.com, that that actually, that the uh, Windows machine that we'll get to next believes that this Linux machine is that, serves that domain. So we'll be able to watch traffic here. Uh, let's see. Well, let's get it right. All right, and then I've got my uh, good old Windows desktop. So here's my malware sample, Best Buy order. So um, it's definitely a Word doc, right? It's got the icon. I'm sure it is. So. Let's take a look at it in a hex editor. Hopefully uh, this is a little, yeah, that's not really viewable, is it? So there is, yeah, I'm gonna struggle, this program, I'm not very friendly, it's not very friendly with making it larger, but anyhow. If you can see it, up at the very, the very first two characters are MZ. This is a signature for a Microsoft PE executable, and it, you can see MZ, so I, I lie a little bit there, but you can also see PE. So anyhow, the two together, part of the signature for a Microsoft Windows executable. So we, it looks like a Word document here on the desktop, but it is indeed an executable. So let's find out a little bit about what it does. So I'm gonna just start up Process Explorer kind of like a, a task manager on steroids, right? And hopefully get that somewhat out of the way. Clear wire shark. So all this uh, noise happened in the background was just, you know, your regular Microsoft Windows noise. All right, so I run it and then of course it says, Hey, Windows cannot open this file. Um, the Windows, the Windows might not support the file type or might not support the codec that was used to compress this file. Okay, so I can't look at my Best Buy invoice, whatever. 
But if you notice, there's now this SVC host.exe running. And I apologize, you probably can't see that unless you're up here in the first front row. But there is an extra SVC host that started up. Those of you that are familiar with ancient Windows, Windows XP, will uh, realize that SVC host generally is a subchild to winlogon, belongs up here. This one just popped up. It's kind of out of place. When, if, you, if you use uh, Process Explorer, you'll kind of get familiar with that. But that is indeed our malware sample um, and part of what it did. And you can notice also that it attempted to make conversation. So it reached out on port 8080 to some IP address. And it looks like, I don't see a DNS request in here. So it didn't, it had that IP address hard-coded or maybe it was part of a generation algorithm. But well, let's see. So that is not quite the focus of this though. So I just kind of wanted to show you what that malware sample does, and then we'll actually dig into it a little bit with these tools. So it, yeah, it, it installed an SVC host. I didn't run a registry scan, but presumably it probably installed some persistence, some way of starting up the next time you reboot the machine. So I'm going to throw that in the Ollie debug, and also in Ida Pro. So again, Ollie debug is our static analysis, or excuse me, our runtime analysis. It's our debugger. So you've got four panes. The left has the assembly instructions that will be executed by the pro that is the program. Uh, on the right are your CPU registers and other registers. Bottom left is memory contents, and you can point that most anywhere. Uh, and the bottom, so I, I said bottom left. I hope bottom right is your stack. So as I pointed out a little bit earlier, the stack is a memory structure. So the, the far left, you could actually also be viewing the stack because it's part of memory. But the uh, far right is showing, or the bottom right is showing you that stack in its structure. So last in, first out. All right. So I, I apologize. I'm going to have to make some jumps here in, uh, in sharing this knowledge with you. But... I think you can maybe trust me. So, and what I mean by that, I'm going to skip over. So, Ida Pro brought up here is our static analysis tool. It's showing the first line of code that it thinks will be ran when Windows hands over to this executable. And what I'm going to do is skip over all these instructions, though, because I've previously looked at it and I recognize that it's kind of boilerplate. It's probably from the compiler or from some tool that they were using to create this. So I'm going to skip to this function here, which to me as an analyst looks like where the interesting code actually starts, where, where their program starts. The, their being the uh, malware author, of course. All right. So when you, let's say you're doing um, exception handling in Python. How are you going to start that out in your code? By someone shout it out. You're going. What's the first stanza or the first statement? Try. Okay. So similar to that, here we are going to be implementing our exception handling. And I bring that up just. Yeah, we'll get to it in a minute. But so, I apologize to those of you who may not be as comfortable with uh, assembly language as others, but. I highlighted this first instruction which here, which is a call. So that is actually where it's handing off to another function, right? Um, before that, there is a number of statements that are doing what? Well, I'm not going to go into every single one of them, but I am going to point out this push right here. There, there's a push, and for those not familiar with the stack, uh, two operations, basically. So a push, you put a piece of data on the stack, and a pop, you pop off the stack. You pop that, that top item off the stack. So some address is being pushed on the stack. Well, I'm going to double click on that, and Ida has gone through and done a couple of things for me. It, it recognizes that this is actually the installation of an exception handler. And I can see here that there are two handler functions. So there's this function here, and this function here that are going to be handling exceptions for this function if 
an exception occurs. All right, back off for that for a second. And what I want to show you now, so this is the graph view that Ida gives you of the code that we're looking at for, for this specific function, by the way. So we were looking up here, and this line of, or this uh, chain of execution is what would normally be executed. What Ida has identified is that there are exception handlers. So there's this exception handler function and this one over here. Two functions that will be called, or could potentially be called if an exception occurs. So let's see how to. All right. Okay, first thing to point out is the presence of this git proc address. And this one's kind of a funny one. But as I mentioned, git proc address is used at runtime to resolve or find the address of a function. And here, git proc address is being used to find the address for git proc address. All right, kind of humorous, but to tell the truth, I don't, I don't know why they didn't you just use the uh, one already resolved, but whatever. Okay, so now, continuing on, there's a create file statement. And if you were to go look up at the Windows, so this documentation for Windows uh, functions is MSDN. If you were to go look up create file in MSDN, you would find that that is actually the function that is used to open a file uh, for read or write. So it's not just creating, but it could be. Uh, I apologize, I wish I could make this a little bit. What you'll see here, though, is that there are multiple pushes with zero or null. So null is being pushed on the stack. And then a call to create file. So if I'm going to create a file, what's one of the things you might expect as an argument going into create file? Maybe a file name, right? Now, that's not 100% true with this function, but a file name might, might be a good thing to have if you're going to open or create a file. So this function looks a little bit odd. Interestingly enough, though, this, this does not create an exception. So this one goes through just fine. Um, I guess I should demonstrate that. So what I'll do is... So here in the static analysis tool, I just want to find the address to go in my dynamic analysis tool. So I've got the address now, 1F11AB6. And I'm just going to go there here in Ollie, if I get that right. 1F11AB6. All right, so This is a call to create file, just like we were looking in the analysis tool. I'm going to hit F4 in all eDebug runs to that line of code. And we're now at that line of code, and then I'm going to step over that. And what you may or may not have noticed is that it went to the next line of code. So in that case, an exception did not occur. Although there were bogus or invalid arguments to create file, the, uh, the authors of create file did not uh, cause that circumstance to, to throw an exception. So anyhow, that's fine. Um, so what, what really is this sample going to do? Um, let's continue looking on, and one thing to point out is... Okay, so here is another call, another function call. And this one is to create process. So create process creates another Windows process, right? So if I, if I in my code want to open up command.exe to get a, a shell to pipe commands to legitimately, I could call create process with one of the arguments pointing to a string with cmd.exe, and it will resolve find cmd.exe. But again here, this create process has all null values being pushed into it. And as we'll find when we run to that one F11 CCC.
All right, so I'm now sitting right before execution of that command, and I hit F8, and the screen completely changed, which, yeah, you probably can't tell very much so, but um, I am now sitting far away memory-wise, or in instruction-wise. I'm now up in 7 Charlie 9, where I was uh, a completely different memory address. What's happened here is the, the exception has occurred, or an exception has occurred, uh, Mike, or Windows has taken control and is about to hand us off to one of those installed function, uh, exception handler functions. So what I need to do is set some breakpoints on those uh, addresses, 1F11CEB and 1F11D11. And actually, I'm just going to skip to the 1F11D11. If I can get the right. All right. Okay. So I'm going to set a breakpoint. And for those who may not know what a, with a debugger, a breakpoint means when you reach this line of code, actually stop the debugger from running and give me back control as the operator of the debugger. So, or as, yeah. So I'm going to do that, but I'm also going to first um, go and tell Ollie debug to allow these exceptions to occur. So one exception already occurred and it, it stopped um, out in the, uh, the portion of Windows that handles exceptions. So I'm going to allow that and then I'm going to let the program run, continue to run. And now I am back at that, ex the uh, exception handler function that was installed at the very first. So I, the the code is now pointing to 1F11D11. Yeah. And as you can, of course. So as you can see here, 1F11D11 was one of the functions that was installed as an exception handler. So basically this whole, oh, come on. This whole branch of code over here on the left, it looks like it does something, but what it does is pretty much inconsequential. And we got down to this create process that threw an exception, and now I've got execution over here on this kind of this third branch. So that could throw off some of your analysis tools. Uh, for example, if this binary were running in an, uh, an automated analysis environment, perhaps they could have made it such that that function, the create process with all nulls, would have been, would have not thrown an exception. So in that case, in that, in that analysis environment or that virtualized environment, that sandbox, execution would have continued straight on down that line and the actual interesting stuff probably would have never happened. So that's just one method that that uh, malware can use to escape your analysis. All right. So now we're over here in 1F11D11, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that I automatically do when I'm looking at code, um, I'll look for a call, and I'll, you know, I'll highlight that. Because again, as I said, a call is handing, or calling another function, right? Calling, uh, it's kind of like in your C programming, if you do, uh, if you wrote another function, add, right, and now you're adding two integers. This is a call to add. So, th oh, sorry, I apologize. This is not a call to add, but that's as an example. Um, so I, I highlight that, and I don't see anything that triggers as a signature in my mind in this code, but I am interested in finding out what that call is to. So you'll see that it's, it's unlabeled, whereas previously... So like here is a call to get computer name. Ida Pro was able to figure out by the, the import table that this instruction is trying to call get computer name. However, this code over here is called to some memory address. So that is resolved during runtime. Something that can thwart my static analysis, right? I could go and try to figure out, okay, where did this memory address get populated? 
um, somewhere presumably on that first line of uh, that first waterfall down where, where the exception occurred at the very end, presumably this memory address was resolved to something. Or I can take that 1F11D2E, that address, and just throw that, say I want to go there, 1F11D2E. So I want to run there. I'm going to run to it. And again, you probably can't see it, but now Ollie Debug has resolved where that address points to. It says RTL decompressed buffer. So again, I could have sat and figured it out in IDA, or maybe I couldn't have, I don't know. But uh, Ollie allows me to run, or a debugger allows me to run to that point and take advantage of the fact that it is running. Um, now, again, you have to do that smart, wisely, right? You have to have some experience there because uh, otherwise you would have just ran down that first chain and you would have missed it. But anyhow, this RTLD compressed buffer, it's pretty straightforward what it does. Um, takes about six arguments. So just to be quick, uh, that second argument is where the buffer is going to be decompressed to. So, so just to, to get there, uh, in the future, I, I jumped there so that I'd have a reference. You can see it's all empty. It's all zeros, if you can see. Um, and then the other thing that it's, the other interesting argument to that decompressed buffer is this, uh, this value where the uncompressed, uh, uncompressed memory size will be placed. So once, once the RTL decompressed buffer has ran that decompressed data, what is the size of it? That will be placed here at this memory location. So let me make sure I'm there. Okay, so then I'm gonna just let that function execute. It's done so, and the only thing that changed is this zero Charlie right there, which you have no chance of seeing. <laughs> so it's the size of the uh, decompressed executable. But if I go back over to the memory that the decompressed buffer was to go to, I see another Windows executable, MZ. So what I'm gonna do is uh, take that file, or take that memory, and I'm gonna save it out to a file. And throw that into Hexplorer real quick. It is an executable, I don't, you, well, excuse me, not right here. Um, so we could go through and we could do the memory offset, but for sake of time, um, I'm just going to do not hex this. And I think it's that guy. All right. So I want to take the second stage or the second executable, and I want to be able to analyze it. So I need to remove all the junk that was in memory before it. Um, that's all I'm going to be doing here is just deleting that. That does not look like my correct executable. Hold on. That one looks a little more sane. Maybe I deleted the wrong way. I don't know. All right. So I'm going to save that out. Throw that back in IDA, and uh, just something to mention, this, this is an IDA demo, so it's free. Um, you can get you know, your hands dirty a little bit with IDA, learn it, and see if it's something actually that you wanna buy. It's kind of expensive, but this, even this demo version does pretty good to allow you to analyze malware. Um, all right, so I've got a brand new executable to start kind of all over the process of analysis, right? Uh, there's a lot to it, but, um, so I've, I've kind of gone through it before hand, of course, and so I'm skipping down to here. This is again where get proc address is being called to resolve functions that, it, that this sample will use. And one of them that strikes as to malware, ana malware analysts is this ZW resume thread. So. Seeing that, I'm going to presume that this sample is going to start up a, a new process, suspended, and then 
It's going to do something to that new process, and then it's going to resume that process, resume thread. Um, doing something to that process, well, first, actually, it's likely to start a legitimate process. So just as a test to see how well I'm doing explaining this, take a guess at what process you think that is. OK, at least someone says, OK. SVC host.exe is the process that is going to be started, suspended. It's going to be modified. Someone else, guess what that modification at a high level might be. Could be process hollowing. So it's going to do something to inject its code into that process, right? So that it looks like it's SVC host running, but it's actually, sure, it's SVC host running with some extra special code. So skipping, skipping some of the, the gory details, I can tell you right here, this function that is being subtracted from the EAX register, yeah, lost it, well, there it is, is what is being injected into SVC host. So I scroll through here, it looks fairly cryptic. Um, one of the tricks I can, okay, so actually, if I, if I try to run this, um, it's, it's very difficult to attach to a suspended process, uh, to attach a debugger to a sus suspended process and be able to take control of it where you expect to take control. So one tip or one trick to try is, I think I'm going to run out of this, run out of time on this, so I'm going to just explain it. Um, what I can do is take this, this function and modify the memory in the debugger that that will be injected into SVC host to basically throw um, a little tight loop in it. So there's an instruction EBFE, which is essentially jump to yourself, and this is Intel x86, jump to that instruction. So if I modify the code that's going to inject this function into SVC host with that, instead of function, or instead of injecting this function, but a function very much like it with the EBFE at the start, it's going to inject into SVC host this code, and it's going to sit there in a tight loop. Well, excuse me, it's, it's going to have that code sitting there, and then when this malware gets to the point of resuming the thread, it's going to sit there in a tight loop. And what I can then do is take the debugger and attach to the SVC host that is hogging all of CPU time because it's sitting in a tight loop, and once I've attached to it, it's no longer uh, active at that time, then I can step through the code and actually determine what's going on. And um, not very far from it, but I don't have quite time to show you. So basically, that this next executable, if I had done that, would allow you to see the, uh, the, the user agent string that the malware is using. It would allow you to see some of the commands that it expects to receive. Um, it, it's basically most of the way there for analysis at a high level to be able to know what capabilities it, it possesses. So, um, anyhow, I'm going to cut it short there. Any questions from anybody? Hopefully, this wasn't too much of a mess. But, all right. Um, so, as far as uh, malware analysis, just wanted to point out. You know, use use the tools that are available to you. There there are free tools. Um, I showed you Ollie Debug and I showed you Ida uh, demo. So. Those tools are out there. You can perform some simple malware analysis. These tips and tricks are out there on the internet as well. Um, hopefully this has been helpful, and I appreciate your time.